Good morning and welcome to Olin Corporation's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. Following today's brief opening comments, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Steve Keenan, Olin's Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'll remind you that this discussion, along with the associated slides and the question and answer session that follows, will include statements regarding estimates or expectations of future performance. Please note that these are forward-looking statements and that actual results could differ materially from those projected. Some of the factors that could cause actual results to differ from our projections are described without limitations in the risk factors section of our most recent Form 10-K and in yesterday's second quarter earnings press release. A copy of today's transcripts and slides will be available on our website in the Investors section under Past Events. Our earnings press release and other financial data and information are available under press releases. With me this morning are Ken Lane, Olin CEO, and Todd Slater, Olin CFO. We'll begin with our prepared remarks, and thereafter we'll be happy to take your questions. I'll now turn the call over to Ken Lane. Ken? Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. I want to start by saying how grateful we are that despite a direct hit on our Freeport, Texas facility by Hurricane Barrel, all our team members are safe. I'm very proud of how everyone responded. We saw the best come out with colleagues supporting one another, not only on site during and following the storm, but with each other's homes as well. Many team members experienced significant damage to their homes, and I want to personally thank all of those who stepped up to help during the recovery. While we did experience damage to some of our assets, Olin's preparations limited the impact of the storm and kept our team members and neighbors safe. Turning to our second quarter results, Overall, the quarter unfolded as expected, with our chemical businesses improving modestly with seasonal demand gains and generally improved pricing. Winchester also delivered on its second quarter objectives as higher propellant costs were partially offset by improved pricing, continued strength in military, and a strong performance by White Flyer. Looking ahead to the second half, we now have greater clarity around the macroeconomic outlook customer demand, and global supply. The industrial economic trough we find ourselves in looks to be longer lived than typical. We expect Hurricane Barrel to represent a setback for our chemicals businesses of approximately $100 million during the third quarter. Based on our current outlook and including the effect of the hurricane, we have lowered our full year 2024 adjusted EBITDA outlook. Olin remains in great shape with our investment grade balance sheet, strong liquidity, and leading market positions. We will continue to be disciplined with our capital allocation strategy as we were during the quarter. Also, we remain focused on executing our value first commercial strategy and continuing to anticipate a bright future as economic activity improves and Olin acts as a coiled spring to serve that recovering demand. Turning to slide four, I'll highlight our efforts in the second half to maximize cash flow. Our teams will continue to focus on cash generation by reducing capital expenditures in spite of hurricane barrel requirements, maintaining cost discipline, and reducing working capital through the second half of 2024. We've done a lot of restructuring around our chloralkali and epoxy assets and expect to continue to realize benefits in the second half. We will continue to stay focused on cost discipline and explore additional cost-saving opportunities. Now let's turn to slide five for an update on our core alkali and vinyls business. During the second quarter, we saw typical seasonal demand improvement, but little underlying recovery or growth volume. Olin has been extremely disciplined and continues to not sell into weak markets. The green shoots of demand anticipated as U.S. chlorine customers sought to restart assets during the second half proved overly optimistic. 
Global industrial activity continues to remain weak, with U.S. chlorine demand still running well below pre-COVID levels. As previously mentioned, Hurricane Barrel made landfall in Freeport, Texas on July 8, with sustained winds measured at our site in excess of 120 miles per hour. Our remarkable Freeport team mobilized quickly to assess and repair damage. Today, fewer than three weeks after landfall, Olin has safely returned many plants to operation. Wind damage to ancillary equipment has prevented the remainder from resuming production. Once this critical equipment is restored, those remaining assets, including our vinyl chloride monomer and phenol acetone plants, will be restarted. Additional global outages have tightened caustic supply and has resulted in upward pricing momentum. For a look at our epoxy business, let's turn to slide six. Epoxy results continue to improve in the second quarter on lower costs and higher pricing. Third quarter epoxy results will be challenged by both the impact of Hurricane Barrel and our plant Stada Germany epoxy resin turnaround. Our U.S. epoxy anti-dumping case continues to progress on schedule with an expectation for provisional duties to be set later this year. We are encouraged that the European Union recently launched a parallel investigation as we pull all available levers to level the global playing field and combat the government-subsidized dumping of foreign epoxy. During the second quarter, we've seen several U.S. and EU importers accelerate their epoxy import volumes. This raises the potential for retroactive duties to be applied, and we would expect our coalition of U.S. producers to request this additional remedy. Olin has been clear with regulators in both the U.S. and Europe that success on each front will be essential to keeping production of these critical materials in region. Please turn to slide seven for a Winchester update. As expected, Winchester's second quarter results were relatively flat versus the first quarter. Commercial ammunition sales were sequentially lower, and rising propellant costs and reduced availability generated a headwind. Domestic and international military sales continued to show strength during the quarter. Winchester military revenues will continue to grow as global defense spending surges. Our Lake City Next Generation Squad Weapon Ammunition Facility Project is expected to generate at least $1 billion of government-funded revenue over the next three to four years. Winchester is a well-respected military partner with a strong brand and reputation within the industry, which provides a solid platform to grow our defense participation. We expect our military sales across all value chains, domestic, international, and projects, to significantly increase in the second half of 2024 versus the first half. This trend of higher military revenue is expected to continue in the coming years. Also, we continue to see very strong performance by our new white flyer business, exceeding all expectations and delivering on synergies. And now I'll turn it over to Todd for financial highlights before I wrap up our prepared comments. Thanks, Ken. Times like these reinforce the importance of Olin's investment-grade balance sheet and our robust cash flow generation throughout the cycle. This strong financial foundation enables Olin to continue running our disciplined commercial model while also currently deploying a substantial portion of our levered free cash flow towards share repurchase. We ended the second quarter with $182.1 million in cash and cash equivalents and approximately a billion dollars in available liquidity. Our net debt has increased by approximately $229 million from year end, which is typical with our seasonal increases in working capital. The quarter ended with a net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio of 2.6 times. Our second half cash flow projection will benefit from cash returned from liquidating the first half seasonal working capital build. We now expect working capital at year end 2024 to be similar to year end 2023. We've successfully deferred our international tax payments of approximately $80 million 
now into 2025. We've reduced our annual capital spending plan by roughly $25 million to approximately $225 million for 2024, despite hurricane barrel requirements of approximately $10 million. With all these initiatives, we expect net debt at year-end 2024 to be similar to year-end 2023. Excluding one-time payments under a long-term energy supply contract of approximately $50 million, our 2024 levered free cash flow yield currently would equate to approximately 8%. Now I turn it back to Ken for a few closing comments. Thank you, Todd. As we fight through one of the longest troughs I've experienced in over 30 years, it is solely due to Team Owens' discipline and leadership that we've achieved the strongest trough-level ECU values ever recorded and superior cash flow generation and share buybacks during the trough. Now, finally, I'm excited to announce that Owen will be hosting an investor day on Thursday, December 12th at the New York Stock Exchange and via webcast. Todd and I will be joined by other members of the leadership team to provide an in-depth review of our businesses, strategy, and financial goals. We will share more details with you as we get closer to the day, but we hope many of you will be able to join us. Operator, we're now ready to take questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchstone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question comes from Jeff Sikakis with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Um, why, did, why did you defer your international tax payment, and will your payment be larger or smaller next year than it would have been this year? Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. This is Ken. I'm going to hand it over to Todd and let him take that question. Yep. Sure, Jeff. You know, this is the $80 million that we talked about even back in 2023 yep. um, related to international tax payments that we had successfully deferred into 24. Um, you know, based on the, the pace of conclusion of those international uh, of the international tax work, um, we are able to defer it into 2025 without additional incremental costs to Olin, um, and it does relate to prior years. So it, you know there is no incremental increase in cost other than that 80 million dollar payment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in in terms of your reassessment of demand for the second half. Are there particular industry areas that were um, you know, th that have slowed relative to your expectations? Hey Jeff, I'll, I'll take that one. This is Ken. You. So you know, back uh, in the first half of the year, even in the first quarter, there was a lot of expectation that we were going to start to see the economy improve in the second half of the year. I think that was a consensus pretty much across um, across industries. And we were seeing some, uh, you know, some inquiries coming in around volume in the second half for for our businesses. But as we got closer to that, they just didn't develop because the economy, frankly, is still is still struggling to uh, to really start to grow again. I wouldn't say that there's any um, significant difference in any one particular industry. There were a couple. Uh, that we thought there would be some some more improvement than what we've seen, maybe in the TiO2 space, uh, maybe in polyurethanes. Both of those have, have continued to be stable, but have not really shown any any growth. So in Q2, you know, the volume uptick that we saw was more of a normal seasonal uplift. There was really no underlying growth that we saw in the market, which you would expect to see if you were going to see growth in the second half of the year. Okay, thank you very much. Next question comes from Hossein Ahmed with 
Albeck Global. Please go ahead. Morning, Ken and Todd. Um, you know, just a question around, uh, obviously, you guys have sort of uh, reset uh, 2024 expectations and, you know, obviously given us commentary around, you know, the demand profile and demand not looking as, as, as great as you sort of thought of to be at the beginning of the year. But just more on the numerical side of things, um, I mean, it seems that excluding the hurricane impact, you're guiding to 1.04 billion in 2024 EBITDA around 940 million if you include the hurricane impact. So I'm just trying to get a better sense of, you know, what you guys think in terms of the trough earnings power of the company, because, you know, it just seems that the bar has been lowered a few times. You know, it was one and a half billion to two billion earlier than, you know, around 1.3. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a better sense of internally how you guys are thinking about the trough earnings power of the company. And thanks for the question, Hassan. You know, what I would say is we certainly are in the trough, and, you're, and if you look at the last the last 12 months, that would, would, you know, I think certainly represent a trough level of earnings. And what I will say is I think the expectations are that um, even if you look at the epoxy business, you know, that is in a, a very unusual position relative to historic performance. So, um you know, that's, that's not a typical trough level. It's, it's really driven by the overinvestment that we've seen in, in China uh, with the new capacity. And we know the impacts that that's ha- uh, having on both Europe and in the U.S. markets, which is why we've got the anti-dumping cases out there. Um, you know, so that's a bit of an unusual case. But I, I do think that the trough level of earnings is going to be somewhere around this level. I don't, I don't expect that, uh, that it's going to continue at this level significantly longer. As I said in my prepared comments, this is a very long trough that we've been in. And, uh, you know, as soon as we start to see the green shoots, uh, not just in the U.S. markets, but also in the China market, we really need to see China um, start to recover and and get the demand in the economy going there. Uh, Europe is probably closer to seeing some improvement, but it's still very, very early, I would say, even in Europe. Understood. Understood. And just, uh, you know, as a follow-up to that whole sort of trough uh, question, uh, and maybe even late last year, you guys were talking about the uh, Value Accelerator Initiative and how that could be a potential quarterly EBITDA tailwind of 25 to $35 million, right? And, and, and I guess, you know, the notion was that you guys were incremental supply with incremental demand, and that'll kind of give you the, the sort of EBITDA uplift. Um, so is it fair to assume that as it stands right now, you know, I mean, Q1 to Q2, the results were a slight increment, and you're, you know, excluding the hurricane impact, not really from Q2 to Q3. So is it fair to assume that you're really currently not seeing at all from that um, uh, value accelerator initiative, and and as and when demand returns, really EBITDA we should think of in terms of as and when your operating rates normalize. Yeah, Hassan, you were breaking up there. I think I got the gist of your question, so I'll take a shot at it. And if and if I don't answer it, then then we can come back to it. Uh, you know, listen, we we were successful with that with that value uh, initiative that we had at the end of the year last year because we did stop the fall in, in the cost of price, and that has proven to be successful. In fact, we continue to see firmness in cost of pricing and even upward momentum at this point in time with the with the outages, not just that we're seeing in our system, but also others in in Europe and and in Asia. So. You know, so there is firmness and there is support for pricing uh, going forward, but we are not moving away from our strategy of of only selling in the markets where we see value that that is acceptable to us, the values that we want to have in our system. Uh, so that strategy is is going to continue, and and focusing on value is what is going to continue to to help us maintain a very high level of of uh, profit relative to historic troughs, uh, you're going to continue to see us generate very good cash flow at, at, at the trough level. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tom.
And the next question comes from Steve Byrne with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. We've got a couple questions about Freeport. Um, you, you mentioned VCM and Phenol, but are the are the four chloroquine operations there in operation right now? Dow indicated they are still getting chlorine. I don't know. Perhaps they get priority for your chlorine out of that plant. But in general, what 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 is what is the most significant issues for the restart of that facility, and maybe a a longer term question for you for Freeport is what are your plans going to be when when Dow shutters um, their PO operation? Do, do you anticipate getting you know further downstream? Are, are you are you satisfied with with the margins you're making on EDC relative to what your EDC customers are making off of that? Yes, you're, you're correct. The assets that you, that you named are the ones that are still down. We have not restarted all of the flooring capacity there yet. As you know, we've got a force majeure system-wide, um, and we're continuing to work through that. But the good news is, is that, there's, that there's not significant, any damage really to the chloropoly assets. It's to equipment uh, that support uh, the, the VCM and the acetone and phenol assets. Uh, so we're we're not able to operate everything yet, but but we're working through getting those uh, those assets back online, and, and the priority is to do that safely and be able to you know communicate with our customers when when that's going to happen. Um, you know, with regards to the future of the assets there at the Freeport site, you know, we're we're going to work through the asset strategy, and and that's a great question for us to be discussing at the uh, the investor day coming up later this year. But we're still working through the options, and of course, we're going to find the highest value option for uh, for the assets there, and and look forward to sharing that with you uh, at the end of the year. And then just a quick question on these. Um you know, these uh, anti-dumping uh, initiatives in the, in the U.S. and, and Europe uh, with respect to epoxy, d does, d does that require some level of government support in order for those initiatives to, to get some traction? And, and what, what is it that, you're, that you view as enabling those four countries to, to undercut you on price on epoxy, it, w it would seem, you know, to be propylene and, and energy related, but what, what, what's your outlook for that? Well, again, our outlook is it's that we favor, you know, fair and free trade. That's, that's what we want to have. And, and what we have seen is over the last few years, there have been subsidized assets that are brought online. Um, that has created tremendous imbalances, and, and people are operating uh, in a way that, that they are dumping materials in, into these markets and threatening local production. So, uh, you know, as I said in, in the prepared remarks, if, if we don't see some intervention with, uh, with import duties to, uh, uh, you know, to get some protection to the domestic producers, they are very much at risk. And, and I think these are, these are materials that we want to continue to, re to produce both in Europe and in, and in the United States market. So, uh, you know, we'll see how this all plays out. We expect to see, we expect to see some, um, some announcements around that later this year. And uh, we hope that, we hope that it's favorable for the local producers. Very good. Thank you. And the next question comes from Duffy Fitcher with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Um, could you just clarify the Freeport startup or restart? I mean, are we talking weeks or months? Can you roughly give us an idea of the timeline there? Yeah, good morning, Duffy. Yeah, what we're looking at, just to, just to kind of scale it for you, is, is weeks and the $100 million that, that we put out there as is, is the approximate impact really is assuming sometime around mid-August we, we begin the, the startup process. You, know, you don't flip a switch and these assets are running on the first day, but, but at least we get the, the assets started up. Sometime around the middle of August is, is what we are assuming. Okay. And then um, maybe one for Todd. 
On the buyback, at least with the numbers you gave, it looked like your average price was about $56 a share. But I think there were only like 11 or 12 days in the quarter that the stock was even at 56. Can you just walk us through? I mean, is it how do you buy? Is it on a couple of days that you take care of it in a quarter? Or, you know, why were we so far off kind of from the average of the quarter? Thanks for the question, Duffy. The, uh, we, we do operate under a, a 10B5 plan, and over the quarter, generally, our purchases are at or below um, the weighted average um, purchase price um, over that, I'll say, the roughly 90-day quarter period. Um, don't forget, included in that number is the 1% tax associated with per, you know, share repurchases. Uh, so that may be throwing you off a little bit, and rounding may be throwing you off a little bit. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And the next question comes from Elsie Yefremuth with Olin. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to confirm that in, in your EBITDA outlook for the full year, did you assume that barrel impact goes away completely in the fourth quarter? And also, does is the $100 million include any insurance recovery? And, and if not, do you expect any in the future? Hi, good morning, Alexi. Uh, yeah, that is a that is a Q3 event. Uh, we, we do expect that all to, to be in the third quarter. At this point, we don't expect to have any uh, any insurance recovery just based on on where we are in terms of the damage levels and, and the deductibles. But uh, that's that's all that all should be in the third quarter. Okay, very helpful. And, and Ken, I mean, you, you've been in, in your seat for some time. You, you just shared sort of the new view on the demand, which which is um, weaker. Any thoughts on sustainability of current operating rates in Chloralkali for your system, sustainability of your pricing strategy, and overall strategy of, uh, you know, pricing for value and operating the way the company's been run for the last couple of years. Um, just just wanted uh, you to share any thoughts on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts. I mean, I, I, I believe very much that we are going to be able to sustain what we have and, and the way that we operate. I, I think I commented on this at the last earnings call. Uh, Alexi, I'm, I'm very impressed with the flexibility that our teams have shown in being able to adjust on the operating rates. Again, based on the model that we're running for, for value, uh, they have learned how to do that very well. And, you know, initially I think it's, it's the sort of thing that you have to go through that learning curve because it is a change in, in how we operate. Uh, but they have done very well at adjusting, and it's everybody not just on the commercial side but also in the manufacturing plants. Uh, we've, we've, we've made some real progress in learning how to operate differently, and we're going to continue to do that. We'll continue also to look for areas to, to optimize and, and reduce costs. That is not something that, that we are going to lose sight of. We are staying very focused on that. And you can imagine that as you, as you do things like what we have done over the last couple of years when you're rationalizing assets, uh, you can still find ways to reduce costs as you optimize the asset base that's left. And, and we're going to continue to be really, really focused on that as an organization. Thanks, Ken. The next question comes from David Edgelitter with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Ken, does the $100 million impact from Barrel include any benefit from the announced price increases for uh, for July? Uh, the $100 million does not include any benefit from from that. You know, we we are expecting to see some improvement in pricing in, in the second half uh, of the year, as, as we said, that, uh, you know, we believe that, uh, especially in the caustic market, there is firmness there with all of the outages that we've seen around uh, uh, around the world. So that, that does include some, uh, you know, the, the outlook does include some improvement in caustic uh, pricing, but that $100 million is, is really just a cost and loss. Uh, lost opportunity impact. Very good. And just again, back on Freeport, pre-hurricane, what were, what were the operating rates of those four chlorine units? 
you, you have? Well, listen, as you know, like I said before, what, what our focus is is running to meet the demand that we see in the market and the value that we like. So we don't focus on utilization rates as a, uh, as a metric in, in terms of our performance or, or how we think about running our business. We do focus on reliability. You know, we want to be able to, to run at the levels that we want to run at, but we're very, um, uh, we're very flexible in, in how we do that. And so the utilization rate, we, we don't, we don't uh, look at that as a, as a metric around our, our operating performance. We focus on reliability. And, and to be clear, today, are any of those four units running today? Uh, yes, we do have we do have some of the units online, but we have not restarted all of them yet. So two on, two off. Is that fair? Uh, no, we're we're not going to comment on any of the specifics around specific units. Okay, thank you. Sure. And the next question comes from Patrick Cunningham with City. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning, Ken and Todd. Uh, so there's. There's some new capacity, you know, coming online in the back half of the year from one of your competitors. You know, how does, in your view, how does this impact the market and your ability to bring back volumes and, and raise operating rates? Morning, Patrick. So I, I don't see that really impacting. That, that volume has already been contracted up earlier this year, even later in the year last year. So it's already in the market. Um, I don't see that being uh, an issue. I, I know there's a lot of chatter about that in the market, but it's 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 already in the market, frankly. So I'm, I'm not I'm, I don't see that as a headwind. Understood. And and you've obviously talked about you know improvement in commercial volumes as well as you know the strength in the military in the back half for Winchester. I'm trying to better understand where we are in the cycle here. You know how you're thinking about cyclicality, given you know the full general discussion across the whole business in, in terms of cyclical earnings power. Well, look, the Winchester business is, is very strong business for us. Um, you know we've seen uh, this year, of course, a big step up in our in our military revenue and and the profitability around that, especially international military. The international military business this year is on track being double what it is. I would not, you know, we don't think about Winchester, that business really having a cycle. Um, it is a much more stable cash generator for us and, and, uh, and a much more significant one than it was even just a few years ago now that we've got the, uh, the Lake City contract. That has been a, a, a very strong business for us working with the, uh, the U.S. Army. So, you know, that business, it, it has some seasonality to it. Typically in the second quarter, it's, it's a little bit weaker. Uh, this year, it was down a little bit more than normal. I think you've seen that across the, in the sporting goods retail space. I think a lot of that is related to the inflationary pressures on the consumer. Um, so it's going to track the consumer part of that business is going to track more of the general economy and, and how inflation is going. Uh, while the military side of that obviously is going to be tracking more with what's happening geopolitically. And the setup right now for that business for the long term is, is quite strong on the military side. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next question comes from Evan McCarthy with Vertical Research. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, and good morning. Um, Ken, there's you know a fair amount of discussion on the share repurchases, but I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on potential for inorganic growth as you take a fresh look at at Olin's portfolio here. The company's been uh, I would say modestly active in recent years through White Flyer and and the Blue Water uh, Alliance with Mitsui. But, but nothing really bigger than a bread box, uh, so to speak. What, what are your views, you know, say for the next two or three years on portfolio composition and potentially using the balance sheet to uh, advance external growth? Good morning. Thanks. Um, well, listen, we will continue. If we see opportunities like the one that we saw with White Flyer, which has been extremely attractive, you know, we've been able to leverage our channels to market and, and really make that business flourish. I mean, it's been very impressive what the Winchester team has done with, 
with white flyer. Um, so if we see opportunities like that, the small scale bolt-ons that we think are going to be highly accretive and ones that we can run better than current owners, we're going to move on those. Anything beyond that, um, you know, we'll we'll talk more about that at our investor day. You know, you can imagine we're we're thinking about where we want to go in the future, and that's part of the conversation. But right now, there's no change in what we're thinking about in terms of how we use the balance sheet. We are going to continue to stay focused on having a strong investment grade balance sheet, and then continue with our capital allocation strategy as we have uh, up to this point. Okay. Uh, then as a second question, if I may, on Winchester, how would you compare and contrast your margins in, in military versus commercial? And perhaps related to that, as the propellant market, uh, market seemingly remains quite tight, um, does that impact or how does that impact margins in military versus uh, commercial, or or is it uh, a similar impact on both of those types of businesses? Maybe you can talk through some of the mix issues uh, that are evolving in Winchester. Sure. Yeah. I mean, listen on on the Winchester side, the military business is is clearly a lower margin than than the commercial business. There's no doubt. Uh, the domestic military is is the lowest. International military is is uh, actually an attractive margin for us. Uh, but still not as good as commercial. So that's kind of the mix that we see across the portfolio. In terms of propellant, um, you know, clearly we're going to prioritize propellant for for the U.S. military. Uh, that's that's one of the requirements around the Lake City assets. So that's uh, you know that's the way that that would work in terms of allocation of volume. But we we've, we've been so far we've been able to secure the volume that we need that both covers our military demand and the commercial demand. It is a very tight market and those costs have gone up. Um, some of that has been offset um, with some pricing, but you know, frankly not all of it. And we're going to continue to see that headwind in the second half of the year. This is this is an area where I think in the market overall, uh, when you look at propellants, um, it, it is an area that uh, there's got to be some strategic focus from even national security concerns that that there's got to be some some clear path forward on how we secure that capacity for the United States uh, uh, demand and, and we don't want to be importing that from from regions that are not necessarily friendly to the US so I think there's more more to come on that I know I know the government is looking at that and we're eager to see where that goes because it will have a long-term impact on on Winchester but being a large player in that market, we've done a very good job securing the physical uh, volume that we need, but you know the cost is still going to be a headwind going forward. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Matthew Blair with CPH. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm glad everyone is safe after the hurricane. For that 100 million impact, is there a breakout between the CAPV and POXY segments? And then I just want to confirm, but it, it sounds like the 940 million full year guide actually does include an assumption of, of better caustic pricing in, in Q4. Yeah, thanks for your question, Matthew. You know, the, uh, the split, if you think about the assets um, that we've talked about, it's, it's going to be around 70-30 roughly. You know, don't, don't make that too precise, but, but that's kind of the range that you can think about, 70 for chloralkali, 30 for epoxy. Um, you know, I would use that as a rough estimate. You know, and, and when we think about the back half of the year, yeah, we, we see that there's pricing momentum. Uh, so in our outlook, we've included some, uh, some improvement in the caustic market. Sounds good. And then, um, you know, according to, to just various market indicators, EDC prices fell by a couple pennies in the second quarter, but it looks like on slide 10, in your system, EDC prices moved up uh, quarter over quarter. Could you talk about, you know, what you were able to do to, to capitalize in that market? Well, I think that's a reflection of our model, right? That's exactly what we try to do is, is manage, uh, manage our portfolio for the value that we want to have. 
and we are very agile in doing that, and, and we're going to continue to um, to use that model. Uh, that, that's why I think I said previously, it's it, 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 there gets, there's a lot of focus on indexes. Some of them are better than others, but but our focus is on getting the highest value that we can for uh, for the the volumes and the assets that we've got in our portfolio, and that's what you see reflected there. Great, thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Arun Biswanathan with RBC. Please go ahead. Great, thanks for taking my questions. Um, yeah, glad to hear things are uh, safe there at Freeport. Um, so I guess just wanted to uh, circle back to um, how you're thinking about prop level conditions and uh, maybe an, er, an early look on 25. So um, assuming we do kind of settle in the mid 900s on EBITDA this year, um, obviously a, a good some of that is is uh, hurricane related. Um, and you noted a couple times that you, you do feel like this is a trough. Um, what kind of growth should we expect, I guess, moving forward? I mean, wh and what are some of the indicators that you're looking for to see that inflection point coming? Is it just kind of macro-related interest rate environment and so on? Um, or is there something else that we can kind of hone in on? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Arun. So listen, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, not, not just in the United States around everything that's happening currently and, and with the elections coming up, but even, even globally. So you know, that uncertainty, I don't think we're going to get any real clarity on where things are going until after the elections and maybe even into the big beginning of next year. So you know, we're, we're taking more of a wait and see approach, but the things, the things that we're going to watch are going to be things like what's happening in the U.S. housing market. Are we seeing uh, the Fed reduce interest rates and are we seeing buyers coming back into the housing market where housing starts to take a meaningful step up? Um, you know, are we seeing that the Chinese economy has really uh, begun to recover because that that is still missing and and the Chinese local demand is going to have to grow significantly to begin to, to help the global econo economy come back. So we're going to be watching those sorts of things very closely uh, over the coming months, but it is um, it is way too early to start talking about what we see for, uh, for a 2025 outlook. Okay, and well, maybe I can ask the question a little differently then. So, you know, if you do have um, a resumption in normal operations, um, you know, given some of the capacity that you've taken out, uh, is that would that be a limitation on your uh, earlier comments, maybe a little while ago, that peak EBITDA is kind of in the in the three billion range? Um, you know, maybe is that now kind of two and a half or? Uh, you know, well below that. And then um, along those lines, um, do you see any kind of structural impairment to any of these markets? I know epoxy has gone through, you know, pretty significant um, pullback, especially in China and demand. It's it's unlikely that China will, re will return to their prior growth rates. So, um, you know, I don't know if they've taken enough action to, to right-size the their own epoxy market either. So, it seems like that business does have some structural limitations that weren't um, there in the past. Uh, and then on chloralkali, again, you've shut down some capacity. So just wanted to understand if there's been been any change in kind of the earnings power of the businesses. Yeah, well, listen, I, I said on in the prepared comments as well that you know we've we positioned ourselves very well with uh, a set of assets that are going to be competitive in the long term. They're very well positioned on the cost curve. Um, you know, we're we're continuously looking at optimizing our asset portfolio, especially around around chloralkali. But our focus is is going to be on operating those assets. As we see demand coming back, we will adjust uh, our position in the market to be the ones that are capturing that growth. I mean, that's really the way we've positioned ourselves. So if you think about the capacity we took offline. It doesn't. It doesn't take away the optionality for us to be that that coiled spring, as we've called it, to be able to respond when we see the growth coming back. Um, with respect to to epoxy, yes, yeah, structurally there are you know more challenges in that market, and and that's why 
again, we've been so vocal about the anti-dumping uh, cases that we have that we have filed. We think that it's very important that, that there is some support that comes into those markets. But ultimately, you know, there probably does need to be some restructuring in the China market. There's probably going to need to be some capacity that comes offline because, to your point, it's going to be a very long time before they're able to grow into that capacity. And when you've seen these sorts of troughs in the past, that's what's happened. You've, you've seen capacity come off in conjunction with growth in the market, and both of those things will, will typically correct themselves over time. But it's going to be years, if not months, before we see that happen. Great. Thanks for that. And just la one quick last one. So uh, if you do generate um – you know that level of EBITDA. You know you will be kind of maybe north of four or five hundred million of free cash flow. So, is stock buyback still um, the preferred deployment of that cash, um, or are there some other options you're considering? Yeah, we are not we are not changing anything on our capital allocation strategy, and we'll continue to be a buyer of our shares with the excess cash that we've got. Um, you know, we still view our shares very much as being discounted to the value that they should be, and, and we'll continue to be a steady buyer uh, going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Arun. And the next question comes from Mike Sisson with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, Ken, you might want to save you know, some ammo for the analyst day, but how do you think about mid-cycle EBITDA here? You know, you've, you know, any thoughts there? And, and maybe to some degree, if you can't get the specifics, you know, when you do get volume growth back, um, how do we sort of model that into better EBITDA and, and sort of maybe a, um, you know, a contribution margin to think about as we get to, as we get closer to mid-cycle dynamics? Sure. Mike, and, and yeah, you're right. You know, that's that's some of the work that we're going through right now is is uh, working through where we where we think those things land, especially looking at our asset strategies and how that's going to shape up, and uh, you know where we're going with Winchester and those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, when I when I think about uh, when I think about where we are and, and, and how we're going to go forward. The biggest, the biggest thing that we see is as that coil starts to unspring and demand starts to come back, that's the biggest lever that we see in terms of, of our portfolio today. You know, yes, there's going to be some steady improvements with epoxy over time. We've already done some things uh, around self-help in, in terms of restructuring and cost reductions. We continue to realize the benefits of that. That's that is coming through in line with what we had expected. Um, as I said earlier, we'll look for additional uh, cost savings and, and put that as a priority as well. Uh, but, but really, as you start to see demand come back and that, uh, that leverage around the volume that we have in core alkali, that's where the real upside is to get you back to kind of that, that mid-cycle level of earnings the quickest. The question is always going to be, well, when does that happen? And frankly, we don't know. Um, we're, we're going to be prepared, though, when it does happen, and we'll be the ones that are going to benefit from that from that recovery. Great. And as a follow-up, when you think about getting to that mid-cycle, you know, right now in slide 10, you know, caustic is stronger side, chlorine's weaker side. So in mid-cycle, is chlorine the stronger side where you really could, you know, lever up? profitability and and maybe talk about you know how that needs if, if that's sort of what creates that higher EBITDA is which side needs to be stronger etc yeah that's a great question Mike and as you can imagine it's all about the time frame and you know I know you're referring to the chart that's in the appendix that we had, had issued it, it's a much shorter term discussion than that so you can't look at a cycle and, and say um, you know, across a cycle, one side needs to be the stronger versus the other. The model that we run, we adjust that very frequently. It's, it's you know, it's going to be within the month we may change uh, between what we see as the weak or the strong side. Um, you know, so that's that's the way that we think about that. It, it's not a 
it's not a long-term play. It's a very short-term um, uh, operational commercial decision making that we need overall, and and, and frankly, that's that's going to be driven by the demand that we see on each side, but it's going to be demand improving on both the chlorine and the caustic side that's going to help accelerate that. Got it. Thank you. And the next question comes from Mike uh, Ledhead with Barclays. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, I wanted to follow up to, to a previous question, just how you're thinking about capital deployment in the current earnings backdrop. Should, should we expect any share repurchases in the second half of this year? Are you comfortable with where your leverage ratio is now intended to end this year? Just just how you're thinking about everything here in the second half. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that, and then I'll ask Todd to add to that. But, yeah, we, we will continue to, to be a buyer, again, with the excess, excess cash flow that we've got. But, Todd, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, sure. You know, we, we've taken several actions here, you know, to really improve our second-half cash flow, and then our prepared remarks are, I articulated them. Previously, we had talked about working capital being a use for the year. We now think that will be at least – neutral. Um, we have deferred the $80 million of international tax payments, reduced capital spending. So all those actions enable us to keep, we would expect, debt flat from where we were at the end of 23 to the end of 24. So that does enable us to utilize our levered free cash flow towards share repurchase, and that will allow us to continue to repurchase shares in the back half of the year. Great. That's super helpful. And then just briefly, I wanted to clarify on the third quarter outlook. It sounds like you would have expected chemicals to be flat before the barrel impact and Winchester should improve sequentially. So is it fair to summarize that third quarter should be down something on a consolidated basis, like 80 to 90 million EBITDA sequentially? Um, Mike, when you, you, your comments on chemicals of Winchester um, are correct um, based on our outlook. Um, in the second quarter, um, corporate and other um, uh, unfortunately had a significant benefit associated with a reduction in the stock-based compensation, uh, much lower stock price. So we would not necessarily expect that to continue into the third quarter. So your numbers might be, um, you know, maybe haven't taken that part into account. Fair enough. Thank you. And the next question comes from Josh Spector with UBS. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Um, so, Ken, in some of your earlier comments, you talked about um, demand for chlorine and, and caustic as well below 2019 levels. I guess when we look at some of the co consultant data, it's kind of forecasting about 10% below. How would you characterize what you're seeing in the merchant market? Is it meaningfully different than that at this point in time? Uh, good morning, Josh. No, it's it's not. I mean, it's in that range. So, you know, we we it's, it's what I had commented before. Until we really see uh, the, the economy generally globally, coming back because, you know, a lot of even domestic demand uh, was supporting exports. And until we see the global economy really, and, and we say the economy is really the industrial economy where, where we're focused, um, that's when we're going to start to see that recovery. But remember, in that time, we've also taken offline a lot of capacity. So that that makes, that, that really tightens the, that spring that, that we keep talking about. Yeah, thanks. And I guess, I mean, to that point, I mean, if I kind of go off of consultant forecast, there's not really a strong snapback forecast in 25, 26, maybe a couple percent a year. Obviously, your circuit is a lot lower, and I assume there's still some slack in other players, and we talked earlier about uh, some additional capacity. I guess, how do you see Olin performing relative to that? Is that something where you can really bring back volumes at a much greater rate than the market without having an impact on pricing, or how do you navigate that scenario? Yeah. Well, listen, that's what you do in commodities, right? I mean, we're, we're focused on having the most competitive assets that we can have. Uh, I'm not going to comment on what, other, what others are doing, but, you know, obviously it's, 
would be a very challenging time to make any kind of an economic case around a large investment in, in these commodities. So I would be I would be surprised. Certainly not something that um, that we're going to be doing. Uh, we've we've we believe that you've got to consider different scenarios when you're thinking about these things because when you're in the trough, it always looks worse, and you never think it's going to get better. Um, and we're not we're not naive enough to fall into that trap. We know things are going to get better at some point. Trying to predict when it's going to get better that gets to be a little bit dicey. So we're going to be thinking about scenarios going forward. We're going to be prepared when that demand comes back uh, with a, a competitive asset base to be able to supply that demand and capture that uh, that demand as as it grows and comes back into the market. That's that is our focus. But you know, there's there's a lot of um, negative outlooks that are out there, and all I'll say is, you know, think about this in scenarios, because if you get too focused on one scenario, you're going to be wrong. Fair enough. Thanks, Ken. And the next question comes from Frank Mitch with Spermium Research. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to come back to the pricing question. It was uh, nice to see uh, that the PCI picked up 15% uh, sequentially into the second quarter. So I was curious, um, you know, looking at your system, what was the biggest driver uh, of that? And uh, and how do you think about the outlook uh, on the PCI? Yeah, thanks for the question, Frank. I mean, listen, like I said before, there, there's going to continue to be pricing momentum in the second half of the year. As, as we've said, the uh, you know, the demand is, is firm out there. Uh, we've seen some seasonal improvement, but supply has tightened up a little bit. So, you know, we're our expectation is that, that going forward we'll continue to be able to manage our portfolio and, and the mix that we have there to, uh, uh, to it, you know, maximize the value for, for Olin. That's, that's our goal. But, you know, it's, it's very hard to – it's very hard to predict where – uh, some of the demand is going at this point in time. Uh, you know, you recall at the first quarter earnings call, we were expecting to see uh, more significant de demand recovery than what we are seeing in the second half of the year. Um, but we'll still look in terms of the portfolio that we have around maximizing uh, the value and the mix of that portfolio. Uh, th thank you. I understood. And, um you know, coming back to the to the comments on indices and so forth. So uh, obviously, you guys do not work off of uh, of indices, so it's more difficult for us to kind of figure out what's going on within the internal uh, Olin system. So I was just curious. I mean, you know, in terms of what was what might I mean, fifteen percent sequential is is a, is a pretty impressive, hefty lift. So I was just curious. You know, was it chlorine? Was it EDC? Was it HCL? Was it you know, aromatics, you know, uh, any any sort of guided or epoxies, what have you, any, any sort of guided therapy be helpful. Just just so we understand from the outside what's really clicking in terms of Olin's uh, pricing mechanisms. Yeah, no, I, I get that, Frank. And, and listen, it's probably it, the easiest way to put that, again, is it will be mix of that portfolio because we are constantly looking at, you know, what are the values of each of the products and, and where are we going to place the molecules that we have. So it's it would be very difficult for me to give you some kind of a modeling basis that would be consistent quarter to quarter because it is a very dynamic um, model that we're going to run and, and we'll continue to do that to be as agile as we can to maximize that value. So it's, it's not something that I can point to that you would be able to then, you know, build into your models consistently and have it be, be correct. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, I, I, I did make note that bleach was uh, the, that bleach pricing was lower in the second quarter, and I would have thought, you know, from a uh, from a demand standpoint, you know, it, it picks up two Q versus one Q. What, what what are the dynamics going on in the bleach markets? Yeah, listen. What what happened with bleach? There's definitely a mix element with that, and and during the quarter, the bleach market was very interesting because the quarter started off cold and rainy, and the demand was fairly low, uh, and then it and then it really got very hot and dry in the second half of the quarter. So there was there was a mix effect in in the quarter, and um, you know again very odd in terms of just the uh, the weather pattern during the second quarter. 
Okay, got you. Thank, thanks so much. Sure. The final question comes from Vincent Andrews with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. <laughs> 